before we launch into what will be the last the last lecture for the semester, or the semester has ended two weeks ago, um, let me just, are there any questions about the final paper? Again, I don't want to be overly neurotic, but I just want to make sure that there are no urgent questions, existential questions, that it's clear about the final paper. So just give you an opportunity, because often if you have a question, it's usually a question that might also be in some other person's mind. So you can take a minute if you have any questions. Or, uh, and remember, what are the two most important things to remember about the final paper? This is the first quiz. Anyone remember? Should be interesting. Yes, so, yes, you're right. Should be interesting. It could be worth my time reading because there's a lot of things in TV that distract me. Um, but in addition to the substance, you're absolutely right, it should be interesting. That's the first most important thing. The two most bureaucratic things that are important. Um, 15th of January. Yes, 15th of January is the due date, unless some horrible thing you drank too much eggnog and you need another few days to digest it. So, again, 15th of January is the deadline, but as I said, if you need another day or two, not a problem, just let me know, you know, ahead of time. And the other, perhaps more important thing, <laughs> pardon? Polina. Yes. Ah. Please do not email me your paper. It will be the cause of the ire of the gods. Uh, on Toledo, there's a function, and if it's not there, it's, it's set up. Please. To, you submit your paper on Toledo. So please do not email me your paper. And the other thing I would ask of you is if you know, or as soon as you know, that you do not want to submit a paper for January 15th because you want to opt for the other deadline in June, um, then please let me know as soon as possible and send me an email. Because one of the things I find disconcerting about the Belgian system is I have no idea who's decided not to hand in a paper because you're under no obligation to tell me then I wonder, have I lost it? Uh, so if you know that you're not going to write a paper for whatever reason, again, um, then just send me an email, a friendly email, and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to hand in my paper for the next exam period in, in June, such that when I have to start figuring out who gets a grade, and, I, and I'm looking at your name, and I'm thinking, did the paper come in? Is it in Toledo? Did my dog eat it? Things like that. Then I can rest assured and say, aha, you told me you're not uh, submitting a paper. And a uh, practical question, what about the use of foreign languages, other languages? Uh, you mean, you, you don't want to write it in English? You don't no, 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 if I have to quote or to, to take. If it's in German, Italian, French, Sorry. Dutch, okay. and Brooklyn, <laughs> I can read it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, again, if, if it's in a language I can't read, then please provide a translation. But quote from original materials, especially if you're going to, let's say you're going to quote from German material or French material. Uh, yes, that's a good question. You can, you can, uh, you just don't worry, don't have to worry about finding translations. Uh, if it's in one of those languages. Okay, yes? <coughs> the length of the paper, I know we went a little bit. Uh, well, you know, there's an official rule of the length of the paper, of how many words, which, 4,500, yes. Thank you. 4,500 yes, words. <laughs> Look, from my point of view, if it's an interesting paper and you have something interesting to say and it takes you six, 7,000 words, I'm happy to read it. So don't worry about 4,500 because that's arbitrary and somewhat meaningless. Uh, on the other hand, don't send me your PhD dissertation. Christmas. So keep it within reason, but again, from my point of view, 4,500 is, is, is awful. You know, if you want to really do something interesting and take the time and do it carefully, you know, except, I mean, all the things that make serious philosophy, uh, you need some space to do that. Um, and 4,500 words is what? How many pages? It's about 500, page, 500 words a page? Right, so it's like 10 pages, 11 pages. You know, especially at this, at the level of where we are, which is we're not undergraduates anymore, you should be given the opportunity to have more space to think. Um, so, I'm happy for you to write more than 4,500. How much more? Just use your common sense. Um, so, I would say no more than 20 pages, you know, 15, 20 pages. So, so that, that allow you to get up to 7,000 words. Um, again, I'm happy to read that, and I would encourage you to. Yeah, you know. As I said last time, you know, 
take it as a serious opportunity to write something interesting and good, and that takes time, that takes space. Uh, so let's say 7,000, something like that. That's not good. And if for whatever reason you are clear, or you had a, you know, like Rosenzweig, you had your moment of illumination, and you think your paper might be too long, just send me an email and say, look, my paper's not 20, 20, you know, 20 pages, and I'll just tell you, okay, maybe, you know, kind of short, or just put QED and it's over. Um, so, if, again, if, you, if you're hesitant and you think, oh, maybe it's a bit too long, just ask, and then we'll figure it out. Does that make sense? Okay, any other questions about the papers class or anything? Uh, okay. If not, then, um, so what we're going to do today is have something of a somewhat of an impossible class because we will not do all the things that I thought we would be able to do. Um, so this will be an impossible class. Uh, but what I thought we would do is divide the class into two parts. The first part is to round off, bring to a conclusion, if you wish, um, our discussion of Patochka. Um, and we'll sort of launch right into it in, in a few minutes. Um, and also take the opportunity for you, as I mentioned last time, the Patochka text is kind of a challenge for you to read for two main reasons. One is, I'm asking you to read the last essay, the sixth radical essay, without requiring or expecting that you've read the whole book. Though, of course, you wouldn't need to really read the whole book to see the full force of what's going on in the sixth essay. But the sixth essay also, in its own way, stands on its own. Um, so where you're looking at something where you don't really see the full context in which it's developed, and I sort of try to provide a rough sketch of the argument of the book, the history of Europe, the history of the idea of Europe, philosophical idea of Europe. We'll come back to it in a moment. So that's one level of difficulty. The other level of difficulty, again, as I touched upon last week, um, is Patash's language is very complicated and very strange. Partly, the English translation is not reliable. So it's not a very good translation of the Czech. In fact, there's a lot of mistakes, which I won't get into, uh, in the text. And then his, his, his original Czech, my understanding, is itself a very difficult Czech to read. Also because he uses a lot of German philosophical vocabulary that he has in his mind, mainly phenomenological vocabulary, vocabulary from Heidegger. And he's trying to translate it into Czech. And then he has his own you know, forms of expression, logic of the day, evocation of the night, which are not clearly speaking or are not clearly to be understood as philosophical concepts in any straightforward way. But they do function like concepts, not just his own concepts. So this is simply just to encourage you, if you have any questions also this evening on um, the vocabulary, the terminology, and maybe broader themes or central concepts that haven't been presented or discussed at length um, that, that you want to talk about, then don't hesitate to ask. Um, but what we'll do is we'll launch back into our discussion um, of, of Patochka, and, uh, um, and then about halfway through the class, we'll hopefully bring that to an end. We'll take a very short break. And then what we'll do for the last part of the class is in a sense, begin a topic or enter into another very complex dimension of the impact of the First World War on thinking, and specifically the impact of the First World War on Jewish-German thinking, Jewish-German philosophers. And there, my, um, my hope is simply to whet your appetite, if you wish, um, because there's no way that we can work through what, 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 you know, the, the full spectrum uh, of Rosenzweig and Cohen. Um, so what I simply want to do is sketch out uh, another, again, dimension of this very complex question, what was the impact of the first world on philosophy, um, and already show you that in a sense the development of you know, the, this great tradition of Jewish, not only German, but Jewish philosophers or philosophers who orientate themselves to the problem of Judaism and philosophy, um, all the way up to Levi, Nas, Derrida, etc. That really, the first impetus for that is the First World War and the debate, if you wish, between Hermann Cohen and Rosenzweig. And I'll just, I asked you to read this quite important letter of Rosenzweig's during the war, known as the Urzema. So it's, it, it already expresses to his friends Ehrenberg that the key idea of his great masterpiece, The Star of Redemption, which he will write as a soldier during the war. I simply want to indicate one idea a central idea in this book that clearly establishes a direct connection between Rosenzweig's thinking and the First World War, 
And that one idea will be the experience of death and the revelation of nothingness, um, which is very central to Rosenzweig's thinking. And that's the connection to Patochka. So not that they're the same, but what you'll see is that in Patochka's philosophical concept of the frontal Leibniz, which he contrasts to the notion of war as total organization, one of the key ideas is that the war is a certain experience of death, a certain structure of revelation of nothingness, that is the pivot or the leverage for a new form of thinking, a new conception of Europe. Um, it centers on the problem of freedom. And in Rosenzweig, though I can only point at it, um, that's also going to be quite central. A, a kind of a certain conception of nothingness and the experience of death um, as the key idea to understand the problem of revelation, which is what he talks about in that letter. So I just want to indicate that very briefly and to say a few things about Herman Cohen, because um, a lot of Rosenzweig's thinking is sort of reacting to Herman Cohen. And Herman Cohen's wartime writings, um, which are, have, are both philosophically interesting and culturally interesting, as I will get into, because Herman Cohen, as I already mentioned, was, was in a sense the object of a quite vicious anti-Semitic attack uh, during the war. And the First World War, and we can talk about it, uh, you know, we talked about it already when we talked about Schmidt, that anti-Semitism sort of has ebbs and flows in German cultural history in the 19th century. And the First World War really produces a certain antagonism between Deutschtum and Judentum that then sets up a certain dynamic with, of course, its tragic consequences in the Second World War. Uh, and Herman Cohen sits right at the middle of that. Um, so it's also interesting um, to, 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 to sort of go back to this question of anti-Semitism in the First World War that we talked about when we looked at Schmidt and, and look at Herman Cohen. And Herman Cohen's attempt to reconcile philosophically Germany with Deutsch, uh, Deutsch tomb, with Juden tomb. In a sense, the whole tragedy of German philosophy in the 20th century is the impossibility of that reconciliation. And that's what clearly Herman Cohen sees in the First World War. Um, and then Rosenzweig's attempt to, in a sense, undo that reconciliation and to affirm something like the primacy of Jewish thinking uh, as the very possibility for the renewal of philosophy. And that is going to be the argument of the star of redemption. Um, and the star, of course, is clear what he means. So I just want to use the last hour of the class not to present anything in depth, but to sort of pique your curiosity to a further chapter in the, the story, if you wish, of what it would mean to understand the impact of the First World War uh, on philosophy. And just a, a note for those of you, if you're here at the Institute, uh, next fall, next fall I will do a seminar on Rosenzweig's Star of Redemption. So I want to do just a full seminar where we read the book, because it's a, it's a great book of philosophy, and it really takes a lot of time to work through. Um, so anyway, this is to pique your curiosity. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Um, so any questions on the plan? No questions on the plan. Let's go back to uh, where we left off last time, and I've tried to make it a bit schematic to sort of organize a bit our discussion. And you'll remember, so here, let me just take a few minutes and summarize a bit what we did last time, launch back into it. Um, so if you remember, we began, or I began by just um, um, telling you that uh, why Patochka is interesting for our concerns is that Patochka is the last philosopher uh, chronologically who recognizes and argues that the First World War is the decisive philosophical event of the 20th century. So it's not for him the Second World War, the First World War. Whereas for people like Arendt, Levinas, Adorno, it's the Second World War. What's really interesting about Atachka is that in the 1970s, he says it's really the First World War. Um, and in a nutshell, the argument is that uh, the First World War, as the original catastrophe of the 20th century, is the original catastrophe of philosophy because it brings to an end Europe as a philosophical project as a philosophical idea. Um, and that philosophical idea, that philosophical project, which I mentioned to you, and if you had a chance to read the radical essays, that's what he develops at the beginning, has its origins with Greece. Um, and it's predicated on two fundamental ideas or claims. One is a certain claim about human life understood through the figure of what he calls the care of the soul. So um, that what it is to be a human being is to define oneself through the project of truth, 
and a relationship to something that transcends the whole. Um, so as I talked about last time, it's patterned on Plato's reflection in the Republic of the problem of justice and the good, the pursuit of the good life. Um, and the second is that this, this conception of human existence as a movement of truth, as care for the self, care for the soul, and again, care for the soul is a platonic formulation, as you know from the Fido, um, is linked to a certain conception of politics or the political, the polis, which for lack of a better word, though it's not strictly speaking accurate, we can call a democracy, the democratic. Um, and that these two philosophical ideas then um, are, are, are lost, are collapsed, um, become impossible in the aftermath of the First World War. That was the broader scheme. And then we looked at how what's quite interesting and quite heretical, remember it's called heretical essays, is that Patochka begins his thinking about the First World War by saying that all interpretations of the war somehow haven't grasped the true significance of the war. So what we need to do is we need to begin with a distinction between different conceptions of war and ask ourselves, what is the true character of the First World War from a philosophical point of view? And here, as he says, my claim is that the First World War, the true character of the war, reveals to us that war is a positive act of what he calls meaning the stone. Um, and that's how he, he begins his essay. And the, the, the strategy of interpretation of reasoning that we started last time is to contrast that with what we've already read and what we discussed, which is the Klieg's philosophy, the war philosophy of Aiken. Because, as we talked about, um, Eugen's uh, wartime speech, uh, Die sittliche Kraft des Krieges, or the moral or ethical force of war, also begins with the same idea. And remember, Eugen says, look, of course war is bad, it's evil, but that's not the true concept of war that's here at stake. So a negative concept of war, we contrast to a positive concept of war. And that positive concept of war is the act of the renewal of meaning. So the, the, the way to ask the question that we asked is, and this you probably should have felt, even in the poor English translation, that when, when, when Adoshka speaks of the grandiose experience of war, of war as constituting meaning, when he chooses as his two witnesses, Tela de Chardin, and most controversially, Ernst Jünger, it's supposed, to, it's supposed to sit uneasily with you. Because it's easy to see this as a glorification of war. Uh, in fact, if you're familiar with you know, the most famous engagement with Patochka's thinking is the essay or the short book by Derrida, The Gift of Death. Um, so Derrida wrote a very nice book. It's a short, short book, short essay, long essay called The Gift of Death, the first part of which is on Patochka um, and the problem of sacrifice and death, and then the second part is on Kierkegaard. What's really interesting about Derrida's um, reading is that Derrida says, look, the sixth radical essay I'm not really going to look at because it seems to be really about the glorification of war. So Derrida elides, if you wish, the sixth radical essay um, and, uh, because in a sense it's too, too dangerous um, because it seems to be when he speaks of war as absolute experience, the experience of the night, of absolute freedom, of the mystery of war, this seems to be a fetishistic form of Klieg's philosophy. So the idea is, let's look at an example of Klieg's philosophy that we read in this class, and try to make a contrast to understand what is Patochka's interpretation of the First World War, given that it begins with a gesture which seems to be the typical gesture of Klieg's philosophy, as we talked about last time, to say that war is actually a positive moral event. And what's at stake in war is the awakening of human existence to its very freedom. So if you go back and look, and here I just schematized it for you, I won't go through it again, so that Eugen starts with, again, these two conceptions of war, the negative conception of war, and then the positive war as meaning bestowal as an ethical, so zittliche, as an, and so not as a political. It's about the dispensation of meaning. And if you look at how Eugen and the zittliche Tatis Krieges, war breaks the attachments of the self to the world. What, what Eugen calls in German kleine egotism, so petty egotism. 
So it's a, it's a kind of moment of rupture, of discontinuity, that has the form of a fundamental questioning. So we question the very nature of all those things that we hold important. Uh, I, I mentioned this book, which is quite important in the US, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. Uh, that exactly is the title of Eugen's speech. War is a force that gives us meaning. What kind of meaning? Ethical meaning. Um, and that the war is an awakening. It's an elevation. And ultimately, what's at stake is freedom, a certain conception of freedom that manifests itself most clearly through sacrifice. Uh, and Eucken, at the end of the text, if you look at the German, uses a, a, a term which has quite a nasty legacy after Eucken. Uh, he speaks of what he calls Blutzeugen des Vaterlands. So Blutzeugen literally means blood witness. Uh, it's the way to speak of a martyr. So it means martyr. So the whole, the whole theory of sacrifice in Eucken is a theory of martyrdom. Um, and martyrdom is precisely to give one's life in freedom in order to affirm a value, in order to create meaning. Um, and he uses the term Blutzeugen, which is a more archaic term. The reason why I say it's a kind of notorious term is that if you read Hitler's Mein Kampf, which soon you can get now in Germany, the now official edition of Mein Kampf, which you know the Bayerische Akademie der Wissenschaft is making an official edition of Mein Kampf, uh, which is an interesting debate in Germany about whether they should do that, whether it should be published, etc. Um, if you look at the preface of Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler so. evokes the memory of these Nazi guys who were killed in these battles with the SA, and he calls them Blutzeugen. Of the national and, and the, blue, the term Blutzeugen is a critical term in German fascism and the veneration of the First World War. Um, so the reason I just draw this attention is that it, you can see in Eucken it sets up a certain conception of sacrifice and martyrdom which becomes, in a sense, used and amplified under fascism. Um, and you may also know that in, in the 20s and 30s there was a whole cult of the frontal labels. The veterans are those who were exposed to a certain wisdom. And it's that wisdom of the front which now has to be transformed politically. This is at the basis of the formation of the SA and the, Storm and the SS. Um, so one sees that there's a very complex political legacy to this language of Eugen, and Eugen shares it with others in the 20s and 30s, and it is the language that is delivered to the Nazis. And, and Hitler echoes that, because of course Hitler himself is a soldier in the war. So he appeals to this idea that I was there, I was in the front, I had this experience, and now the question is, how will this experience of the war transform fundamentally society into a revolutionary transformation? Now the reason why I emphasize this is not only because historically it's important to see the continuation of the rhetoric of the First World War in the 30s in Germany, its amplification. Um, the, the, the cult of the fallen soldier. There's a great book by a great historian, uh, Moss, of Fallen Soldiers, so George Moss, which is a there's a cultural history of the cult of martyrdom in the 20s and 30s in Germany and how that was essential for the rise of fascism. Um, and, and, and also in the Second World War, you know, the cult of the soldier who has died from the fatherland. But the reason why it's also important for us, in addition to this historical resonance of First World War Kriegsphilosophie in, in German history, cultural history, is that for the question of Katachka, it's to show you the, 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 dangerously, the dangerous proximity of Patechka's own language, and we'll have to ask about the meaning, but the language, too, a language which resonates very clearly in Kuhn's philosophy. Uh, and this is clear when he speaks of the grandiose experience of the year, when he 
speaks about Hans Jünger um, and the idea of sacrifice. So the question for, for us will be to see what is the difference, at what point does, at what point does, so the question is at what point does Patochka's discourse of the First World War break from Krieg's philosophy or does it? And that's a very complicated question. Um, so that's to sort of remind you of the strategy of, of, of our reading. And the last thing by way of summary so we, is, and us, so remember, so we started with, Patochka makes a distinction between two kinds of war. Again, both kinds of war are present in the First World War. So it's an interesting thesis that within a certain concept of war, there is another form of war, which is not so much a concept, but an experience. That's why he really emphasizes the notion of ambience. It's an experience. Uh, and this experience opens up another frame of meaning than the frame of meaning of the war that we fought. And this concept of war, which we might call negative, just so, is understood through, again, this idea from Hans Jünger of total mobilization which then Patochka interprets in a philosophical way, the idea being that for Patochka, the 19th century from a kind of quasi-Heideggerian point of view is the triumph of nihilism, meaning that the fundamental relationship to being is a relationship of power, so will to power, um, and that this is the, the height of metaphysics as, it's, as, the, as the forgetting of the question of being. And this this form of nihilism that fully comes to light in the First World War, because the First World War is fundamentally the expression of absolute force that mobilizes all of the resources of society. Um, and of course, he's thinking about the advances in technology, mechanization, and the way in which um, soldiers themselves become killed anonymously in mass. This is what he calls the logic of the day. But then on the other hand, the war is also the expression of what he calls the night. So this is his language. The night is the return of the orgiastic. And that's where it's quite different from Heidegger's interpretation of metaphysics. And the return of the orgiastic is the return of a kind of primitive need or will to be fused with the whole the Dionysian. Such that from a Patochkin point of view, the First World War brings two, two, two contradictory forces into a kind of perfect artwork. One is the will to power over the whole. So in Heideggerian terms, the will for total manifestation, total control over manifestation which is the metaphysical essence of technology. And the First World War is the great war of technology. So the attempt to dominate the whole, to make it completely present, completely objectified, as well as the will to fuse with the whole. So what Nietzsche had described as this Dionysian, to become indiscriminately fused with the whole, to lose oneself completely with the whole. And these two forces, if you wish, are brought together in the First World War. So the First World War is both primitive return of the orgiastic and the most hyper form of modernity. And that in and of itself we can talk about. It's a very interesting way to think about the war. That it's both hyper modernity and Ultra primitive at the same time, um, because of this return of the ODS. And this sets up the proper question of the relationship to the whole from a philosophical point of view, which will be neither one of trying to dominate it and control it, and neither one of being fused with it. And as I mentioned last time, this is the classic Platonic problem of Socrates in the relationship to the whole, right, and, and the problem of the good. Um, this then culminates in a certain conception of sacrifice, and sacrifice is the key concept uh, that illuminates this difference.
what Pachacha calls a relative sacrifice. And a relative sacrifice is a certain valuation of death, where death gets a value by being inscribed in a symbolic order. And if you've been looking at the MOOC, of course, this is a fundamental concern for many, the iconic poem of Wilfred Odom. Dulce de Poem es How sweet and beautiful it is to die for, for one's country, for one's nation, and um, the sort of cynical, ironic line of uh, Wilfred Owen, you know, don't believe the old lie. So, Padachka's claim is that what characterizes this conception of war is a certain meaning of sacrifice and the relationship between sacrifice and value where what we value in sacrifice is precisely the way in which we sacrifice ourselves for a value. So I am, you know, mort pour la patrie. Uh, and this is what he calls relative sacrifice, which is really part of the mechanization of sacrifice. Or if you want to put it in a more contemporary French idiom, it's the inscription of the gift of sacrifice into an economy of exchange. Precisely because the value of sacrifice as a gift, and what is that gift? It's the gift of death. Because I give my life for America to defend freedom. And the value of that gift is inscribed within an economy of exchange. I give my life for the value, such that the value itself has life. And if you go back to Oiken, you'll remember that Oiken that it's a bit creepy, the vocabulary he uses, but it really is that it's a kind of, you know, what I call a vampire theory of value. That the values, the eternal values, draw their life from blood. That's exactly blutzoidin. The more blood is spilled, the more the values are meaningful as values. Uh, that's why we should all we should willingly, as, as, as Oiken says, and again, when you read it, to get a shield on your spine, what he calls the freudige Tat of sacrifice. Um, if you're interested, it's, it opens a whole very sophisticated problem about war as a festival, as a festival of sacrifice. It's the argument that the French writer Roger Calvois His friends were Jacques Vatan, you know, French were obsessed with the form of sacrifice in the 20s and 30s. Michel Nair, this Jacques Vatan. Roger Calois says that war is fundamentally the festival of sacrifice. That's why he thinks that the structure of war is the structure of the festival. It's the eruption of ordinary time, it's the permissibility of violence, it's what he calls the immense wastage which has value. Um, and there's a, there's a really excellent book by a historian of the First World War called Morris X. Hughes. He's a professor in Toronto called The Rights of Spring, which I would recommend to all of you. I think it's one of the, probably one of the greatest books on the First World War by a historian. Where he argues, where he shows that in 1913, there was Stravinsky's performance of the Sacre du Printemps the most important piece of 20th century music that opened up 20th century music and theater with uh, Nijinsky, the great dancer Nijinsky. If you know the rites of spring, the rites of spring is all about the festival of sacrifice for the renewal. And what Mortis Eckstein shows is that in 1913, the rites of spring, the performance of the rites of spring, and the absolutely chaotic rebellion provoked by the audience, because when people heard the music, and saw the dancing, they rebel, they attack, basically they attack the, you know, so was, people attack, they actually stopped the performance and attacked the, you know, the artwork, if you wish. Um, and it was the event in Paris, Proust was there, André Gide, etc. He shows that this whole, that the artwork of the, Stravinsky, The Rites of Spring, is itself the premonition of the First World War. Because when the First World War breaks out a year later, in August of 1914, you have the enthusiasm of everyone is going, to, to the festival. And that festival is the festival of sacrifice. Sacrifice in order to affirm balance and renew. Uh, so it's a really fantastic book about 
the, this cultural history of the war and the way in which the war is, is understood as, as a festival of sacrifice. Uh, and that you see, again, in Eugen, with this idea of Blutzeug. And, and that's exactly what Atochka then, in his notion of relative sacrifice, in a sense, identifies as the culmination of nihilism and the culmination of Western metaphysics. So that's the way in which he tries to show that the First World War brings to a kind of completion the development of Western metaphysics. Um, and it all turns on this interpretation of the gift of death through sacrifice in terms of a value which is affirmed. Um, so that's why he calls it relative, because the value, the meaning of sacrifice is relative to what I'm sacrificing for. So the, you know, the reason why you honor me as a warrior is because I've served my country. And that's why I get on the plane first. Or I get a 10% discount at Duncan Bay. The work is all about the gift of that. Fundamentally. And it would have been a year It's a thing of the past. Um, and this is the sense in which they're not soldiers, they're warriors. You know, no, one, no one calls a soldier a soldier. I mean, they're warriors. Or heroes. Uh, and it's interesting because the notion of hero here, and this will come back to what we talk about later, is a modern concept of hero, not a Greek concept of hero. Why? Because the hero is the person who sacrifices himself for the whole and receives their individuality through that sacrifice for the whole. I died for my country. I'm serving America. America proud. Um, it's a modern conception because if you look at the Greeks, who's the most famous hero of the Greeks? Achilles. Achilles. And does Achilles sacrifice himself for the whole? No. He says, I'm not going to help you guys. Right? So the whole is, is the Achaean, the Achaeans. And he's willing to sacrifice the whole for himself. So Achilles says, I don't care if you lose to the Trojans. You took, I can't say this, it's not PC, you took the woman that I, that I stole. Uh, remember, Briseis is the slave girl that he gets. And then Agamemnon says, I want it back. You know, they sacrifice her because the gods are angry, Apollo, etc. And so when Achilles is pouting in his tent, playing his lyre, eating grapes with his lover Patroclus, and the Achaeans are being destroyed by Hector, the hero is precisely the person who doesn't sacrifice himself for the whole. Because what it is to be heroic is to affirm oneself greater than the whole. That's why the Iliad is, sing us the song of Achilles, not sing us the song of the Achaeans. Because the, the true singular individual is the person who elevates himself over the whole. And who is willing for the whole to be destroyed in order to elevate himself. Um, so that's a very different conception of the hero <coughs> than our modern conception. And that, the reason I mention this is not only that in Junger there's also a kind of interesting reflection on what does it mean to be a hero. Um, and this idea of the hero as the person who sacrifices himself for the whole as an inauthentic conception of sacrifice, which is central to Patochka, is in part inspired by Els Junger. Because this is also Ernst Jünger wants to re re recaptivate the true nature of what it is to be a soldier, which is to confront an enemy on the battlefield, almost like Greek heroes. But he sees that what is the First World War? The First World War is we don't encounter the enemy, we don't see the enemy, we are killed without seeing who we are being killed by. And it's just a kind of orgy of death. And that for him is not war, it's something else. And there's a kind of eroticism of true war that Jünger is longing for, uh, which is very Greek. And of course, the erotic component of Achilles and Patroclus is very important. But, uh, the, the rage of Achilles is erotic. So that's the sense in which this is this notion of relative sacrifice, which you also find, again, in the Wilfred Owen poem. So it's an interesting thing that many, many people are critiquing a certain notion of sacrifice and the fanaticism of 
Um, and this is the notion of sacrifice which for Patakta differentiates and distinguishes this conception of war from an authentic notion of combat or what he calls the front experience, which will be a which will have the structure of a revelation, which will be something like a transformative experience, uh, a, a meaning bestowal, which will still be tied to a notion of sacrifice, he's going to call it absolute sacrifice, which is going to be grandiose. So it has this aesthetic vocabulary of the sublime and which will open the possibility of a genuine future for Europe. And then the tragedy of the 20th century is that precisely this revelation, this experience, which should have transformed European society and opened up a new future, actually is closed. And the legacy of that closure is the Cold War. So the Cold War is, in a sense, the legacy of the unfulfilled promise of the First World War as opening a horizon for the redemption of man. Um, and that's then, if you remember, the end of the heretical essays is an ambiguous ending. Why did nothing change? Why are we back in the logic of the day? Capitalism, materialism, etc. Um, and this is in the loop, what I call the problem of homecoming. That the veterans come home and nothing has changed. And that's why that film by Abel Ross formulates this problem. Okay, before we now launch into looking at the details of the front end of this, are there any thoughts or questions on, again, this conception of war as total mobilization, which is the First World War from a philosophical point of view, as the culmination of the <coughs> metaphysics of nihilism, and how within this experience of, to me, within this concept of war, there is nonetheless another front another horizon. This horizon is an alienness that, that was experienced by a few individuals. And I'm going, I, Patochka, I'm going to look at the testimonials of two of these individuals, Tela de Chardin, to do a kind of phenomenology of this front alienness as a transformative experience, um, in a sense, as the reinvention of the experience of philosophy. Because it will have all the characteristics of freedom, truth, and it will be ultimately a kind of revelation of nothingness. So in his language, it's, he uses the term the night, the evocation of the night, the experience of meaninglessness in the confrontation with death becomes transformative. And, and then we'll see that that leads to the most, I guess, one of the most visible concepts of Patrick, what he calls the solidarity of the shaken. So those who have been fundamentally shaken and transformed by the war now build a solidarity, and that solidarity is the proto-structure for the society to come, for the Europe to come. Um, okay, are there any <coughs> questions or thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah. Right. I, I was wondering, um, does one have to be a soldier to have the front elements? Yes. Because I was thinking, for example, um, victims of uh, genocide, um, because Patochka, he writes about um, what creates the transformation is the experience of like, the horrifying and, and the, the violence and the blood and everything. Couldn't it be that this same transformation happens uh, in victims of, uh, yeah, in citizens? Well, if you, so yes, in the sense that if you read it, well, clearly if you read it in the, according to the letter of the text, and I would even say in the spirit of the text, the frontal limits is a very specific kind of experience. So it's specific to the First World War. That's why he uses the term frontal limits, which is a real marker. Uh, as I mentioned, if you, if you look at, and there's actually quite a number of very interesting studies about the development of fascist paramilitary groups in the 20s and 30s, and it's all about the cult of the front soldat. Uh, and in fact, all of this, you know, this iconography of the Nazis, of the SS, is actually prepared in the 20s and 30s. That's the Franz And this idea that they have this special experience, which is political, which is genuine political capital, let's say. Um, so it's clear that Patochka is thinking of a very specific kind of experience. And the fact that he then 
relies to develop what I'm calling the phenomenology of this experience by looking at two soldiers, witnesses, if you wish, um, that even makes it even more specific. And that's why I think what he's saying is that, look, I mean, I didn't have that experience. I, uh, the philosopher did have it, but these individuals did. And so I'm going to rely on, and I'm going to show that there is something like a phenomenological reduction that happens in their description of the experience of the front. Um, so the position of Patochka as the philosopher is to interpret the witness. Um, and that it's quite specific to, these, to, to this type of experience and to these types of individuals. There's also a third reason why I think it's very specific for um, Patochka, at least in the letter and spirit, is because, as I didn't make explicit, but I'll now make it, Pilar de Chardin is French. And Jünger, of course, is German. And we can talk about it. it. I think it's quite deliberate that he takes a German and a French. And actually, that's where we see it in important part of ways. Because, I mean, you can already see what's he trying to say by saying that there's <coughs> content in this. And in order to give a testimonial of that, I will look at the German guy, I mean, Ernst Jünger, the most important writer of the war. Um, and then Tela de Chardin, which is probably not known, but in the 20s and 30s, Tela de Chardin was quite an important cultural figure. Uh, he was a kind of French mystic priest philosopher. Um, and of course, what's he, what's he saying by saying, I'm going to look at a French and a German? What he's saying is that the experience of the war overcomes the division of enemy. Yeah, so that's why I think it's that specific, because it, it, it's that specific because he really wants to say that, look, the solidarity of the shaken, so it's a solidarity. It's the most primitive political, you know, today in Europe, we always talk about solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. As you know, solidarity is a key term in Eastern European movements, Solidarność in Poland. It's a key philosophical term of Patochka. And you know, Patochka is the, the most important intellectual of Eastern Europe at the time. But of course, it's very unlike how you know Habermas thinks about solidarity, or how Van Hom, you know, that's, that's your Belgian uh, Hermann Van Hom, yeah, yeah, yeah. because when they talk about solidarity from a Patochka point of view, they have you know this is not the gen this is not the solidarity he's thinking about. Uh, precisely, it's the solidarity of those who have experienced such a destruction of meaning that the very position of enmity from which they started is overcome. So solidarity is something that one arrives at from absolute enmity. So, um, so precisely that for the French, the Germans were barbarians. And therefore the German has to die for Germany. And that from the German point of view, if you go to Eugen, the Germans have to die for, or sorry, from the, so for the French, the French has to die for France this is about soul, against those barbarians for humanity. Um, we have to be without mercy and pitiless because what's at stake in the war is humanity. And so each of us has to be willing to die for it. And the Germans, well, we have to you know, destroy these French. We have to die for the fatherland. We have to be a mute zone in this fatherland. Uh, and so I think what Patochka is suggesting, though you can see it's very subtle because he doesn't say it explicitly, is that Schade and Jünger undergo this experience when, in a sense, they're, they're purged or purified of this nihilism. In a sense, they're purged and purified of a kind of nationalism. Um, and what emerges is a solidarity of the shaken, where the solidarity is based on having nothing in common. Precisely because they started as enemies. And that's why the experience of freedom is the experience of nothing. So it is the community of those who have nothing in common. Oh, I can't it what they have in common is a certain experience of war. And that's for polemos. And that's why I think it's very specific. Now, now this is where your question becomes interesting. 
it's an interesting question to ask whether this, this let's call it phenomenological analysis, because it's a kind of reduction. It's a suspension, you know, Husserl says the suspension is the annihilation of the world. This is read literally. The First World War is the annihilation of the world, which reveals the true meaning bestowal activity. So that's why it's deeply phenomenological. Um, that meaning bestowal activity, of course, is not a transcendental subject. In fact, it's no subject in particular. And that is the experience of nothingness in, in Patochka's terms. Um, that's, the, that's why death, these are individuals who face death. Um, now, it's an interesting question whether this, whether this analysis then can be used to, to one could extend it. Um, and here, one, I would say obvious, but one possible idea that comes to mind is the dissident culture in Eastern Europe. Because um, the dissident culture in Eastern Europe, especially in Czechoslovakia, especially around Patrushka, was made of both the Stalinists who were dissatisfied and disillusioned with Stalinism in the 50s, and all of the dissidents against Stalinism, who those very Stalinists tortured, were now part of the dissident movement of the 70s. So you had the sense that victim and torture come together through a shared disillusionment in a system. And this shared disillusionment in the system is the solidarity of the shaken. So then, once you see it in Patakra's own context and say maybe he's also thinking about that, then it opens up the idea to whether you could, I don't know, do a kind of identity variation and say, look, there's other, per there's, uh, there's other populations or other historical experiences where you would have that. Um, Though, of course, in the case of genocide, it's very complicated because if you think, I mean, if we think through what Patrick is saying, he's also saying that within the experience of the solidarity of, shake, of the shaken is something like forgiveness or reconciliation. Precisely because after the war, if Chaudet and Jünger, the German and the French, are now bound together through a solidarity, then they don't hate each other. And whatever horrors they inflicted on each other during the war is now reconciled because now they are part of the same community. Now, of course, with the genocide, with the Holocaust, that gets very complicated. Could there be reconciliation between you know, the, the Holocaust victim and the Nazi? Uh, and that's where the analogy would start to break down. Partly, of course, because it's a different power relation. Um, so there's a lot of differences. So that's where with genocide, it starts to break down. Also because I mean, the relationship between Shabbat and Numer is not one is the, you know, the Nazi and the Jew. They're both soldiers. So the nature of the violence is quite different. But it does open the interesting question of whether from absolute violence, the only possibility for solidarity must pass through some form of reconciliation, i.e. some form of solidarity. <coughs> if that's not the case, then according to Patochka, the experience of violence is not meaning the stone because it doesn't fundamentally transform anything. So basically you have cycles of violence and there's no true break from cycles of violence to peace. And, that, and those are the passages where he says, look, after the war, there was no genuine peace because true peace is something else. Um, what there was was a temporary cessation of hostilities. And then, of course, what he has in mind is, of course, after the, after the First World War, you know, you had the Second World War. And after the Second World War, you had another war, which is the Cold War. So what, he, what he's asking himself is, the First World War, for all of its horror and destructiveness, didn't change anything from a philosophical point of view. <coughs> because it perpetuated another war, and now we're in the 1970s. Um, you know, which is his perspective. And the Cold War is, you know, in a sense, it's a great metaphor. It's the First World War frozen, missing the Germans, right? So he says it's still about a fundamental clash, permanent state of war, the threat of absolute destruction, the rise of capitalism, commercial, you know, fascism, etc., which for Patochka are all different expressions of the will to power over the whole 
and so that's how he reads it. Um, much like Khan Arendt, you know, that democracy and totalitarianism are fundamentally different, but they obey the same logic of the day. And of course, it's an interesting question from our point of view in 2015, whether we are still caught in a kind of cycle where if the First World War was the original catastrophe of the 20th century, then Patoche's claim is that the 20th century is war, fundamentally. Uh, and now the new war is against ISIS, or terrorism, and something else. Uh, so you can see that that's the claim of Patoche, that the 20th century is war. That's what the 20th century is. Uh, total war, and permanent total war, which for him is quite different than the kinds of wars that happened before the 20th century. Again, I don't want to crash your Christmas spirit. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a serious philosopher. Uh, but so I, 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 your, your question is really good because in one sense, no, but you can see that, but you can see unfolding in Patochka this, so again, the experience of the fundamental is very specific. And precisely why it's specific is that it's a kind of, and we'll see when we talk a bit about Rosenzweig, it's the attempt to think the possibility of redemption and the experience of war as a new opportunity for redemption of mankind. And then the question about why that, that opening, that possibility, is gone. So in a sense, the First World War has changed absolutely nothing from a philosophical point of view, from Heidegger's, well, it's also Heidegger's point of view, but from Patrick's point of view. Um, and that's, the, that's why it's so specific. Because the paradox is that it's a meaning bestowal, but nothing enduring was bestowed. So that's why there's a kind of deep irony in the essay. Because he starts by saying, what's heretical is war is a meaning bestowal, I'm going to show you this. But then what I'm showing you is precisely the absolute experience of meaning bestowal bestowed us absolutely nothing. And so you end up with the essay saying, what do you have? Nothing. Um, and that's why it's an interesting question whether the, 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 the essay ends with a kind of note of the tragedy. Yes. Uh, when I was thinking of this uh, notion of heroes, I mean, much of Achilles, and the first thing that came to mind was this famous statue uh, that Hitler commissioned, uh, that's of Achilles, and it says, from the greatest German to the greatest Greek. And I was thinking about World War II, and that's kind of a proper war of heroes. Like, you have these larger than life figures. You've got Hitler, you've got Stalin, you've got Roosevelt, and even generals like Patton and Mongol. And it, it seems as if it's kind of a proper return to this ancient Greek notion of, of a war. And I was thinking of the rest of the 20th century. And it seems as if the Cold War, you kind of still have these heroes to some extent. You still have Stalin and whoever was president or what have you. But it's still, but it's also this total mobilization and it's a lot colder. Like in Vietnam, for example, you're not fighting against uh, um, a particular individual, you're fighting against Charlie. So I was wondering which of the two wars, World War One and World War Two, would be the aberration of the 20th century? Well, from a Dutch and Jung's point of view, it's the first World War. And the reason is because if you go back to you know, the idea of the heroic, uh, in Achilles, as I mentioned, it, uh, and, and you look at, you know, but how we understand the hero, both today and in the First World War, Second World War, the hero is the person who sacrifices himself for a whole greater than himself. Now that whole is the nation, the community, America, Germany. In one sense, you know, you just plug in the content, but that's the structure of sacrifice. Um, whereas Achilles is precisely the person who sacrifices the whole for himself. In the sense that his, his heroic status is to say, I am greater than the whole. I will not die for the whole. And that's why the first line of the Iliad is, you know, sing the song of Achilles, because the death of Achilles is not a sacrifice to, to give more value to the Achaeans. In fact, the Achaeans look ridiculous, and right? they're the brutes. They destroyed Tro Troy, which was civilization. And they killed Hector, who had a loving wife. And, you know, this was true civilization. Um, but the, the, the immortality 
which is what Achilles gains by being a story that will be retold and worthy of being retold is the immortality of the individual, not the immortality of the whole. The other thing that's quite different is in the First World War, as of today, everyone can be a hero. You just have to die. <laughs> but it's quite important that in, in the Iliad, there can only be one or two heroes. So, in World War II, you've got Hitler as this proper Achilles. Which is yeah, but it's again, it's, it's in this modern logic of Hitler represents the nation. So, you know, one of the most I guess, dreadful portraits of Hitler is him, uh, I can actually draw, he's on a horse in this shining armor, <laughs> you probably know it, and he's holding a flag, you know, the Nazi flag, and that's precisely it. He is the fear of the nation, of the people. And whatever meaning there would be, again, he didn't sacrifice himself, but whatever meaning there would be to German soldiers is to sacrifice themselves for the fatherland. But again, Achilles doesn't sacrifice himself for the fatherland. Achilles sacrifices himself for himself. Now, for, we think that's absolutely selfishness. But the Greeks think that's what a hero does. A hero doesn't give a damn about you. A hero only cares for himself. It's not selfish because it's an elevated sense of what he's doing. He's doing great deeds. And that's why there can only be one or two heroes. And the only thing that heroes are interested in is fighting other heroes. Because killing you people is meaningless for me as a hero. Because where I really test my mettle as a hero is Hector. Um, so the world is divided into two. There are those people who are dying horrible deaths in the Iliad, which are which are described in tremendous gruesomeness, which shows you how horrible war is. Because, you know, the descriptions in the Iliad are absolutely brutal. The sword went through the lung, and you could hear the air come out of it. The arrow that goes through the eye. I mean, it's, you couldn't visualize it. If you put it in a movie, you'd be horrified. It's, it's extremely graphic. It's graphic violence. But it's meaningless. The only thing that's meaningful is Achilles. And, and um, and that's the sense in which there's two, you know, there's, there's sort of us and them. There's everybody getting killed in the war, which is completely meaningless. We're not singing a song about them, though the names are indeed preserved. I mean, that's interesting that classical scholars have made catalogs of the names, and every death in the Iliad is described with a name, so there still is this individual. But the individual is not Achilles, which is the, the song is about Achilles. Um, and that, again, that's very different from our modern conception of, of hero, where in principle, anyone can be a hero. In fact, you can be a hero without doing anything. And I don't want to be you know, disrespectful, but if I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and a plane crashes into my building, I'm all of a sudden a hero. But from a great sense, you, what did you do? You were just unlucky. <laughs> I mean, the gods just didn't favor you, but you're not a hero in any meaningful sense, because you didn't do anything, you didn't risk anything, and most importantly, you didn't confront another hero. This is precisely Hitler in the hero in the Greek sense. He burns down Germany for himself. And he's fighting not you know, No, but if you read Mein Kampf, I'm not saying put this on your Christmas list, but if you read Mein Kampf, <laughs> it's very clear that it's about Germany. I mean, that's what's so effective about the struggle. My struggle is your struggle to make Germany great. If you follow me, you know, he's not wearing a hat saying, make Germany great, <laughs> but it's the, same, it's the same logic, right? To personalize the struggle of the nation in order to say that I am speaking for the nation, and I will say those things that everyone thinks but doesn't want to say. Namely, don't let those people in. You just have to read Mein Kampf. I know it's not all the quite reading this, but you see very clearly that it's not, it's very modern in a sense, it's very modern in that regard. Um, or at least it's clearly not Achilles as understood in the terms of the Iliad. And this is something which, in Junger, Junger is very attuned to that. Because what Junger bemoans about war is not that people are being killed, but they're not being killed the right way. For him, the right way to die is with honor, in real confrontation, with the aristocratic idea of the real soldier. 
and what he sees instead is people being mowed down and things like that. For him, that's, I mean, that's what's complicated about rumor. The horrific part about war is not that people are dying, it's that they're not dying in their way. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, if you remember on the MOOC, if you still look at the discussions on the MOOC, there were a number of interesting discussions about that. Um, and if we abstract from the quite different historical and cultural contexts, they're radically different. Um, but the moral logic, if you wish, is the same. The moral logic is precisely, so let's go back to Lincoln. That's why Oiken is interesting. You know, it's a bit crazy for us to read it. But remember how Oiken begins by saying, look, there's a distinction between war as the pursuit of politics, economics, psychological, things like that, um, which has a certain rationality. Um, and the consequences of that are bad. Evil. But then there's another war another conception of war, uh, which in Germany he says entgegensetz, which means counteracts this one. Um, and this is one that's determined by the logic of Blutzeugen, of sacrifice. Namely that there are, you know, there are certain values in a modern language, a certain set of beliefs. Um, these beliefs are elevated above, above other beliefs. And then the elevation of the beliefs over other beliefs counteracts those beliefs. And then the value of that belief, binding myself to the value of that belief, takes the form of dying for it. In such a way that it permits collateral damage. Because that, that's what, in a modern vocabulary, what Wiken is saying. Wiken is saying, look, we Germans, Okay, we destroyed Leuven, but we can accept the destruction of Leuven. It's not an evil. So it's an evil only if you have this notion of war, which isn't, isn't counteracted by a sacred war. And remember that he calls this notion of war Heilige Krieg. It's a, it's a religious war. In which whatever kind of notion of just war or justice, which we would normally accept, i.e., in the context of the First World War, you know, the traumatic event was the destruction of the University Library in Lille. Or today, you know, putting bombs and shooting people in cafes. Uh, and it's difficult for us to sense that, but the sense of outrage in the First World War to the destruction of Lille is proportional to our outrage today to terrorism. Um, in fact, if you read a whole matter all, and he says that quite clearly, he says, look, kill people, but leave the cultural artifacts alone. And I don't know if you looked at the move, but it's you know, before all of this you know, horrific attack in Paris, one of the discussion questions that we proposed is, in the context of the fourth module, on Omar Roland's logic, there's a just cause to go to war against ISIS for their destruction of archaeological monuments. Because you know ISIS is destroying these priceless archaeological sites. From Omar Halal's logic, that is in itself cause for war. Um, but so in Eugen, Eugen's strategy is to say, look, destruction of Leuven, rape of Belgian civilians, this is neutralized. It's counteracted through the affirmation of a set of values for which, which, which are given reality and, and legitimated um, through, the, through a kind of pure moral intention. I mean, I will these to be the morally pure values. And by giving myself for those, by killing myself for that, I accept as permissible all the collateral damage. Um, so it is, you know, that's why he ends with Blutzeugen. It's a theory of the martyr. It's martyrdom, um, which is a religious concept. Uh, and what it does is, in modern psychological language, political language, it reduces what political scientists call the, trans the transaction costs of the decision. They mean, 
You don't have to worry about all the complexities of the decision if you're motivated in such a way that it simplifies. So it reduces what they call transaction costs. Is it really good to, to kill civilians? Should I do this? It gives you a kind of absolute clarity. And as importantly, and this is what the, the, the leading, I guess, you know, anthropologist of suicide bombers is a French guy called Scott Atran. He's a French American. Um, who's done a lot of interviews and work with people who, you know, recruits of suicide bombers in Palestine and Indonesia, so it's very empirical. And what he argues is that what motivates suicide bombers is not so much the value, but the way in which the value produces social cohesion. So, the va so in, in dying for a value, it allows me to have a bond of solidarity. And it allows for solidarity among the group. Um, and this is exactly what Oikin says. Because what Oikin says that what the sacrifice and the awakening and elevation of sacrifice will do is, as he says in German, es bringt uns innerlich zusammen. So it brings us together in an intimate way. So not in terms of our social relations, which are one of alienation, economic relations, you know, I go into the store and I just buy something without looking at the person. I have no true solidarity with the Wallonians. But now, I have innerlich solidarity with the Wallonians through sacrifice, through martyrdom. Um, so the same logic of martyrdom as a social function of producing solidarity. And that's what's psychologically effective. Um, that's something which, which in his own language, Eugen describes, I and mean, that's his argument. Um, and it's interesting in response to your question that you know, people who research it today want to see the same pattern. They want to say, look, um, that's why you know, what Scott Atron says is that, look, there's no, it's not economic because you know, a lot of these suicide bombers are wealthy, they come from middle class families, they went to universities, so you know, the guys of 9-11 were not idiots. They, they could fly planes. They had engineering degrees. Um, they had families. Or this couple in San Bernardino you know, had a six-month-old baby. So it's not that they're poor, they're stupid, there's something else going on. Um, they tend to be actually quite intelligent. So he argues that really what, what motivates them psychologically is this idea of social cohesion, social solidarity. Um, so they're willing to sacrifice themselves for a value in order to produce solidarity. And that's exactly what Oikin <coughs> argues in a different context. Because that's exactly what he says. The war will bring us together. Um, now what's interesting is that it brings those together who already have something in common in Oikin. Because it's about Germans. So, if a French guy sacrifices himself for us, it's meaningless. Only Germans. That's why, again, it's, it's actually central that it's about blood. I mean, that's the mechanic. <coughs> only German blood will secure German values. Um, so, it, 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 in a sense, it, it brings social cohesion to a group of individuals who already identify with each other. But what Pachetka seems to be saying with the solidarity of the shaken is precisely now we have a sense of solidarity which emerges by breaking any structure of recognition. Precisely because the German doesn't recognize the French because the French is the enemy, the absolute other. So there's this interesting ethical thing that the genuine moment of the ethical is in a sense to not recognize the other as other than me without recognizing the other as me. Because that's the structure of the enemy. The enemy is the other who is not me, with whom I could never recognize myself as him, uh, with him. Um, so that's a sense in which the solidarity of the shaken is based on nothingness. And inter some interpreters today who are more liberal with Patashka see this as saying, look, this is really interesting because this is the notion of democracy. It's the encounter with others without trying to reduce them to my identity. But the sense of otherness of the other is not the Schmittian en enemy. Because it would be also interesting if we had more time, which we don't, to talk about Schmidt. Because remember, Schmidt 
for Schmidt, this is irreconcilable. In time. So, so war itself cannot produce a mechanism for overcoming the, the antagonism of friend and enemy. Because precisely that antagonism constitutes what it is to be a war. But the Patochkin idea is that here is an experience of war which overcomes that. And it is an experience of war, um, namely the front end leaders. And as I said, some people today say, look, this is really interesting in Patochka because it's this idea of the democracy as the community of those who come, that is <coughs> open, um, that it's not about identification, it's not about totality. It, it, it has this ethical structure to the other. Um, and so they, going back to your question, they're trying to read a more general structure of the ethical within a very specific analysis of this historical experience. Um, whether you can do that or not is a matter of debate, but it's an interesting idea to, to, to say that that's really what Patochka is sort of saying, um, or what could be said through Patochka. Um, okay. Um, any other questions on the first? Before we say a few more things about this, though we've already talked a bit about it in your questions, um, but we can take the time because it's the end of the news. Okay, if there are no other questions, let me just say a few things about, we've already talked a bit about the, the anatomy, if you wish, or the phenomenology of this front end leaveness. Um, and remember, the idea that within the war, there is this other experience, this redemptive experience. It's something that many writers, in the, after the First World War, they're looking for a way to think about how the war could offer an experience that would allow us to overcome the very conditions that produce the war. Um, that's basically what, what, what um, Patashka is interested in saying. And here, as I mentioned, he looks at these two guys, the Nabishabe and Junger, um, I already said who they were, and he wants to say, look, they have a kind of structurally similar form of experience. An experience which, if you look very closely at how he describes it, has the structure of a, of a religious conversion. It has a structure of a conversion, namely, the self experiences a, a condition or experience of utter meaninglessness, of senselessness, the senselessness of the war, of the violence. That forces the self, I'm sort of giving an abbreviated version of this, that forces the self to question all of its attachments to values and meanings, to its culture, and it forces the self to break an attachment with itself. And this is ultimately the experience of my being towards death. So there's also in here a kind of interesting argument with Heidegger, in Heidegger's analysis of being towards death as, as calling me back to myself. Um, and this is the experience of nothingness, the revelation of nothingness, the meaninglessness. Uh, which again, as a historical note, is prevalent. You know, the idea that what the war shows us is the empty, the meaninglessness of European values and culture. And this is exactly what Dadaism is about. The absurdity of the war is that we believed in that we were the civilized one, we believed in this notion of art and beauty, etc. And all of that now has been shown as utterly meaningless. And, and the reaction to that is to reconstitute meaning through an aesthetics of the absurd. This is a similar problem, but a different kind of reaction. And it's not the structure of the absurd. It's the structure of mystery, as he calls it. And the attempt to regain what it means to have meaning through the experience of the total collapse of meaning. That's why it's phenomenological in that sense. Um, so the war performs the reduction. It is the literal annihilation of the war. And this, however, doesn't lead us to a positive meaning. It leads us to the experience of nothingness. And that experience of nothingness is the face of death. Or, or, or through the confrontation with death that I may die, there is the opening of the experience of nothingness. Um, and it's there that then Patochka now speaks of the idea of that experience as liberation, as absolute freedom. Uh, in a Sartrean way, it's liberal. Um, 
And this absolute sense of freedom is an absolute experience, which allows me to then reconstitute myself as a subject, as a, as, as a newborn subject, in solidarity with others who have also gone through this experience, even though we don't need to recognize each other. That's what it, um, and this is the sense in which then the, the, the war uh, is also then tied to no shorty call absolute sacrifice. So not a sacrifice for anything, but the intrinsic value of being confronted <coughs> by nothingness and death is itself the condition for the bestowal of the meaning. Um, and then this is what he calls the, the solidarity of the shaken. And that is the, the analysis that he gives um, of, of this redemptive experience of violence. Because again, it's a redemptive experience of violence. I'll just make one more comment that we can talk about if, if you have questions. What's really interesting, both looking ahead to the three sentences I will say about those and so on. Um, but a much more larger problem, which would be itself another class, uh, it's quite interesting that the first one more in the context of Atoshka's interpretation of it but directly in the context of Rosenstein, introduces the philosophical concept of nothingness. Because it's precisely what he's saying is that the war is the experience of nothingness. In a very Heideggerian sense. And if we have time, if you look at Heidegger's essay, What is Metaphysics? You can see there's an interesting thing that it's the experience of the nothingness that seizes itself, not in boredom and in angst, but in the experience of this violence which neutralizes and questions our attachment to being without revealing being as anything, but as nothing. So it's interesting that you could also show that the First World War is the context in which the problem of nothingness enters into 20th century philosophy. Um, and that's why death and being towards death is quite important <coughs> for people like Matachka, for Heidegger, for Rosenstein, um, for Sartre, for Sartre's being in that in this. Is a book written in the context of the after war. I mean, he didn't experience the first world war, but the, the trauma of the war for France in the 20s and 30s. Um, and this is the, then the idea of the revelation of nothingness. And the revelation of nothingness is freedom. Um, it's the ground that is no ground. And that then would be the place from which to reconstitute something like the self and meaning. But it's precisely this process of reconstitution that doesn't happen after the war. Because we fall back into metaphysics, to put it bluntly, and nihilism. Um, and that's then the tragic lesson of the war, is that the war is something that gave us a moment of redemption and closed. And as I said, we in the 1970s, and if that were still alive, I think he would say we today even more so, are in a sense in this period of mourning for a possibility of genuine redemption that never happened. Uh, and since uh, it, we've forgotten that what has been lost is the possibility of redemption, of renewal of Europe. And that's why for, from a particular point of view, there is no Europe today, as I said, to put it a bit polemically, there's just bureaucracy and a nostalgia. There's no There's something else there. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's how the, the essay ends with that question. So that's exactly how the essay ends. With this Socratic, that's why he, remember, he invokes the idea of Socrates. Uh, so I, I, I cannot tell you what it is. I can just tell you it's not happening. That's the genuine philosophical moment, the Socratic moment. Um, if you want a more fleshed out version of what that would mean in a very different context, that would be Rosenzweig's new thing. Because Rosenzweig will try to think through what would the meaning be of redemption for human existence in the aftermath of the war. And that will require that we take seriously Judaism as the true philosophy. Uh, that's the great cheekiness of Rosenzweig, to say that's what the First World War shows us. That the redemption of Europe is the star is Judaism. Um, I mean, Judaism, again, as, as a philosophical idea, so not, it doesn't mean that as, as the empirical religion. Um, but in a sense, your question is right to echo 
what's so difficult about the end of Patochka, that the, the Patochka's essay ends with a question. And the question is your question. Uh, and, and the inability to know, well, the ability, the, 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 and the fact that we still today ask that question shows us that there was no meaning to the first order of Because if there had been a meaning, we wouldn't be asking the question, what would redemption look like after, of humanity after the first world war? Well, the meaning was to ask the question. Pardon? Well, the meaning was to pose the question to be asked. Yes. I mean, so that's exactly right. That part of the meaning of the war is to introduce that question as a question. But then Patochka thinks that that's not enough because then he explicitly says, why is it that after the war nothing changed? So clearly for him, it's not simply the eruption of the question that's important. That's clearly important. But it's also the failure of hope and the failure of the promise of redemption in light of that question. Um, and it could also be that today, we don't even are, we're not even bothered with the question. So we're very complacent, not thinking that we're in a fundamental state of spiritual crisis. Because we're no longer moved by the question of, the very question that articulated in the First World War, the need for redemption from mankind. And that's, I mean, if you remember the letter from Rosenstein, that's exactly what Rosenstein is thinking about as he goes to war is the question of revelation and redemption for mankind. That's, for him, the burning philosophical question. Um, Could it be as well that we are not facing this question because we answer it <clears throat> by saying that redemption is not possible? So there is no way of, uh, there is no reason to be busy with this question anymore. We answer it negatively. Well, I think Patrushka's sensitivity or temperament is more, there's no, the only meaningful negative answer to the question is to forget the importance of the question. Um, so, it's not that the, it's, so it's not that, it's not that we've learned that the answer is impossible. It's just that we no longer care about what it is that that question is asking of us. And that is because we no longer care for ourselves in terms of truth, the problem of truth. So he has this Heideggerian sensibility that questions, it's not so much that questions are answered or not answered, but questions are either questions that we live in or we don't live in. So the relationship to question is one of forgetting and remembrance, not so much of asking an answer. And what the First World War is, is the eruption of a certain question of what it is that we care for when we care for ourselves where he says that what ultimately we should care for is the good and truth. That's why it's deeply platonic. Uh, but the structure of the everyday is to not want to know that that is what we should care about. And instead, what we think we should care about is money, sex, power, Rihanna, from things that, you know. So it's, you can see it's very platonic that the war is the eruption in the cave. Question. Um, and, and, and then we are back in the cave. And to be back in the cave is to be in a forgetting of a question. And, and here what's important also, it's quite high to you, that Elsa, uh, Junger and Shabbat don't ask the question. The experience places them in the question. So, so fundamental philosophical questions are not things that we do. They're things that we succumb to in particular historical events. Yeah. Um, and so now, and we haven't owned up to that question. We haven't taken responsibility for the question that was asked of us through the war. Um, if you wish, we haven't responded to the call of the question. Because we've gone back to the logic of the everyday in Patochka's language. So there's a kind of irresponsibility to the question that the First World War asked of us. And that irresponsibility is the legacy of the 20th century. And the consequence of that is that the 20th century is war. So there's also, and if you read the Derrida text, The Gift of Death, what's nice about Derrida's argument is that he really emphasizes that the key notion of freedom in Patochka is about responsibility. So, Freedom is about taking responsibility absolutely for something, uh, for a process of questioning.
So I've got to look at hiding area in the blue sense. Meredith? thinking. And the problem is exactly as you describe it, that um, if he insists so heavily as he does, that it's an alienness that transforms these individuals, um, then the question is, what is our relationship to this alienness, given that we are in a position where we cannot have this alienness? And, and the almost double bind that on the one hand we have to look at these individuals and look at this experience because this is the moment of revelation of this redemptive horizon. <coughs> but precisely we're looking at something from which we are structurally excluded. So then the question is what is the resolution to this problem? Um, partly it has something to do with thinking about what is the function of the philosopher. Uh, so Patochka, who in a sense is himself giving testimony to this experience and, and, and distilling it philosophically. Um, that's one way to think about it that, it, that the philosopher in a sense is the intermediary, if you wish, much like in Plato, because the philosopher is an intermediary figure. Now it's not between the gods and man, but it's between those who have had an experience and those who have not. So there is something about the philosopher as an intermediary figure. Um, that might be one way to think about it. Uh, another way to think about it is that structurally there is no answer to the problem, that structurally there is something about the experience which, um, in a sense, it's in that moment, if it indeed it brings about a transformation, if it doesn't, then in a sense the window is closed. And so then the relationship of the philosopher to that experience, again, is one of mourning. I see what is no longer. And I try to reflect on that, um, which again is very Heideggerian, that thinking is unthinking on something that is lost. And the importance of philosophy is not nostalgia, but mourning for that which has withdrawn. For, so, you know, this Heideggerian thing, you know, we are, we are too late for the gods, and or too late for God and too early for the gods, or I forget which one is which. But this idea that we find ourselves in this in-between position, and that's what philosophy does. A third possibility, and again, I don't want to decide, but I just, would be to say, and some people will read this, it might be a stretch, um, but some people say, well, look, Patochka himself was a kind of martyr. Uh, Patochka himself had this kind of position as a dissident who was involved in dissident movement, who died after this police interrogation, you know, who took this risk. So Patochka, in a sense, lives a kind of Socratic life and understand himself as a Socrates where the state condemns him to death. Now, not as directly as Athens did to Socrates, but if you, if you build into the biography of Patochka a kind of martyr idea, living the life in truth at all costs of political costs, then you, it gives you interpretive room to say, well, maybe the figure of the dissident and the dissident philosopher can be an echo of the front end of this. Um, now, of course, not in any obvious way, because it's very different, but I, I won't get into this, but one of the key ideas in Patochka is the idea of polemos, or violence, war, et cetera, which is really a philosophical concept, which is essential to political life, and is essential to philosophical thinking. And so polemos is, of course, war in the literal sense of the 
But Patrashka thought that polemos was constitutive of thinking as such, and that the, the, and that the philosopher is a kind of figure of polemos. Um, so if you read it that way, then there's room to say, yes, we don't have access to this experience other than as we can interpret it, but we ourselves as philosophers, as intellectuals in the context of dissidency, occupy a position of polemos. Um, and so that's, and people who really emphasize Patachka's dissident identity, I think, like to think of Patachka in this way. Um, that this is, that in a sense, people would want to say that this contains cryptically, so it's not meant to be seen, a philosophy of dissidence. That he, that he covers through this highly allegorical and seemingly wild interpretation of the First World War. Um, and that, I mean, that you would have to do some real Straussian interpretive digging to get that out. But that could be there. Uh, but again, your, your question is a really good one. That, that's a real interpretive problem in understanding Patachka. That, that's definitely for sure. I mean, methodological for the, his own methodolo methodology, what is his relationship to these texts? Because um, one of the things he doesn't tell you, Chardin is a very complicated guy. Yomer was clearly a great war hero. He's the last German soldier to get the highest order of the Poland from the Kaiser himself. Which is, um, but Chardin never saw action at the front. So Chardin was actually in a regiment, uh, in a medical unit, and uh, he, he was carrying a stretcher. I mean, so, you know, he, was, he could have been killed, but he wasn't the frontline soldier. You know, Junger was the real thing. Junger was in charge of the stormtroopers in 1918 in Ludendorff. So, you know, Junger, no one can impeach. His credentials are impeccable. It really is the Achilles, the guy who was wounded three, four times, the guy who no one could kill. Uh, um, I mean, also, Junger served the war from 1914 to 1918. I think it's unheard of that someone, one person survived the war like that. It's you know, somehow the pagan gods, <laughs> like in, in, in Homer, the gods have to protect you. If Athena doesn't protect you, you're going to die. And, Jünger was protected by the gods, also because, as you know, the Nazis wanted to get rid of him in 1942 after he wrote this novel called Über die Marmor so about the Marmor Cliffs, which was a critique of Nazism, though Jünger himself was a, a German officer. Was he? And Hitler said, you can't kill Hans Jünger. You can't arrest him. It's Hans Jünger. At the same time, the French resistance also wanted to kill Hans Jünger because Hans Jünger was an officer in Paris. Um, and then I forget it, it's either South or somebody who says, you can't kill El Sumer, it's El Sumer. So neither the French resistance nor Hitler wanted El Sumer to be killed, because El Sumer was El Sumer. Um, Shabbat's a bit more complicated because he actually never was a front soldier. So there's also this very complicated thing that he's relying on a memoir, and Shabbat has a lot of fantasy about the front. Whereas Jünger, you know, there's no fantasy there. So there's a methodological problem about what's the method of interpretation that allows you to read these texts in this way. That's one problem. The second problem is then, what is the position of us today vis-a-vis -vis this experience, given that we no longer are capable of having that experience? And those are two, I think, quite interesting problems in Patashka, that one can pose to Patashka's thinking. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, actually, you've answered it in a way, but um, you said uh, Patashka's, um, when he's thinking, it's all about um, get, it's get towards the truth, and um, which is uh, platonic in a way. Then the question is, um, if I'm going to look at this, what then is the truth for him in modern time now, in in twenty in in twentieth century? What can we say is the truth for us now? Well, Patek has a very um, that's called a complicated notion of truth. Yeah. Um, and also it's not clear whether for Patochka the, the problem of true or the truth, whatever that would mean, has to be understood ultimately in terms of the problem of the good. Yeah. But if we go back to Plato yeah. and the Republic, because yes. I think the Republic is a kind of master text for Patochka. I mean, though he's very different than Plato, but remember that very briefly in the Republic, the argument of the Republic is that what it means to truly care for yourself 
um, is to define oneself vis-a-vis -vis the good. Mm. And the good is that which transcends being. Mm. So it's very important. It transcends being. It's higher than being. So the first question of philosophy is not what is being, but what is the good. Um, and that the genuine care of the soul in order to find orientation in the world, in the polis, is to relate to something which transcends, which is the good. Um, and then the, the, the structure of the movement of the self in its orientation towards the good is something like the structure of living in truth. Because Patashka, when he speaks of truth, truth is not a proposition or a form, truth is a movement. It's the idea of truth is a certain form of life. Um, so it's a notion of truth in terms of a form of life. Living in the truth. And what it is to live in the truth is to live with regard to the good. And the good is that which transcends the whole. Um, the order of being. Or, or beings. So in Patakshi you have structurally the similar idea that the care for the self, as well as the polis, because of course that's why the polis has to be ruled according to the good of the philosophers. Um, that this is the form which is a movement of the true. And so that's structurally the idea that for Patakshi, again, this experience of the break with the world, this transformation, this opening to a revelation of nothingness, but, um, has the, the, the relationship to something that transcends the whole. Now, he never names it the good. That's what's complicated. Instead, it's the nothing. Uh, but again, nothing is not nothing. <laughs> Nothing is not nothing. So he never calls it the good, but it's, but it's nothing is the nothing. He speaks about that as freedom. Um, in this text, he doesn't say more about what that is. But you can see that it has the same structure. Okay, so I actually understand it. So he speaks, of, um, he speaks about nothing as freedom. Yes. So in other words, um, in these phases of, um, of course, from the um, what started in World War One itself, and it moves to the 1970s to today, as we speak, then um, the question that we are trying to answer all through these might be a question of free freedom. Yes, but freedom it is, you know, Patashkar has a metaphysical concept of freedom. So it's not freedom in the normal way we think about it. But I mean metaphysical, that it's not negative freedom, you know, I'm free to do what I do until someone tells me not to. It's not freedom in the concrete sense of autonomy, either a system of rights or laws. Um, it's an ontological concept of freedom. Okay. By that I mean that um, we have to think, you know, it's formulaic, we have to think the problem of being, of being from the problem of freedom. Okay. And therefore we cannot say that freedom is anything. If you want another comparison, which I think is quite important, is Sartre. Right? Because for Sartre, freedom is nothingness. What, what he means by that is, whatever it is that we ascribe and describe as our freedom is an objectification, is, a, is, is, is the entrance of freedom into being. But freedom is always measured by the capacity to break an attachment to what is. That's what freedom is. Um, and in the same way, Patushka approaches the problem of freedom because he thinks that freedom is a more basic concept than being. And therefore, the way in which to describe freedom is through its rupture with beings. Because I cannot say that freedom is anything. Because as soon as I say that freedom is anything, I brought freedom into ontology. If you will. Um, I mean, the guy who's behind all of this is Shelley. And this is Schelling's, you know, this is the basic argument of Schelling's, you know, that I'll treat as something with freedom. We cannot think freedom in terms of being. We have to think being in terms of freedom. Um, and that's why freedom is upcombed, as he calls it. Lack of ground, abyss. 
from which then emerges the products of the soul, the relationship to the world, etc. Uh, so I, I would say that Patatka is in this tradition of the concept of freedom as the form of nothingness, which it's shown. And so that's why he's going to say that freedom is the experience of nothingness, the evocation of the night. Again, these are, these are sophisticated philosophical concepts that come from German idealism and are filtered through Heidegger. Um, our problem today is that we have objectified freedom. We have ontologized it. Um, so that, that's... Uh, and, and that's that's our problem today from a theoretical Okay. Any other thoughts or questions on that? We can take time for it's interesting. Uh, and I, what I, I hope you see, especially from the, the questions, that you know, you read Patashka's test, you know, like the first time I read it, I'm like, what the hell is this? But you, you don't really know what's going on in that text. It's a very strange text. But the more you think about it, you realize that. It's a, you know, it's a profound kind of reflection um, because it really encapsulates a very complex philosophical thought or set of thoughts, which is not apparent the first time you read it, especially because the vocabulary is strange. And it goes very quickly, and it moves very, very quickly. It's an essay, and it's heretical. And we still don't know where the heresy is. There seem to be at least three or four. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, is it not more of a problem that we have two systems both vying for a, a connection for the good? Or like on the West, the Christian versus the East, Muslim. And they both claim to have a, a direct connection or to the good or to be serving the good or to be serving truth or speaking truth. And is it not that the confrontation that is the Uh, well, if I can, I, so, I, mean, I, I don't want to know, I don't know what Patrick would say about today because I'm not Patrick. Um But Patrick's, one way to formulate Patrick's critique is to say that, um, so let's bring it back to the 50s and 60s and 70s and then we can move to today. Is that for Patrick, both total, you know, Stalinism, communism, whatever you want to call it, so the East, and the West. Um, and this is where the political implication of Patochka's thinking is actually quite complicated. Both are, from a metaphysical point of view, as Heidegger said, the same. They're the same because they both attempt to, I use a different vocabulary, realize in a form of total imminence the good. Now, the meaning of the good or the highest values, of course, is different in the East than in the West. But both are the attempts to create a totalization in which the good would be fully realized in history. So it's the attempt to reduce the distance between the transcendence of the good and the imminence of the world. Um, and this is why then the movement of both Stalinism and capitalism is one of totalization. And therefore, it's, it's about power and totalization. And it's the belief that we have already acquired what is the good, and now we need to realize it in the world. So we are, you know, there's no disagreement in America on what is good. It's about freedom, liberty, whatever. We might disagree about whether you know, Syrian should be allowed in, but you know, everyone will say, we know what it is that is good. And our project as America is to realize this good in the world. Likewise, you know, you know Khrushchev, Stalin, of course, good is something else. It's this, the values and things like that, and we're going to realize. So the idea is that these are projects of totalization, a creation of complete imminence. Um, and that's why, from a metaphysical point of view, there's no difference between the East and the West. Now, whether today, whatever ISIS or whatever that is, again, I don't know, I'm not an expert, 
Whether that's also movement totalization is we can interpret it that way. And if we if we say it is, then and clearly from the question of how it understands sacrifice from a bunch of square view it is. Because thinking that I'm going to realize values by sacrificing myself is, is relative sacrifice from a point of view. So Adachka's point is, and maybe this allowed me to say a few words about Wolzenzweig, is precisely to break and have an experience that breaks the talent, that introduces the relationship to the infinite, if you want to let me know the same term. Introduces a relationship to the infinite. Uh, that is the language of mystery and nothingness in life. It's a radical experience of of being open and dependent on something which is beyond our control over us. Um, and that is the anchor point for the construction of meaning. And, and, and the anchor point for a life in truth. So one way to think about what Patrush is up to is that it's a critique of any form of totalitarianism or totalization, be it capitalism or Stalinism. That's why it's heretical. So when he says that nothing has changed after the First World War, what he says is the West and the East is still this reign of metaphysics of force. Um, now, why I say it's politically complicated is because this is a critique of democracy. And I mean, as it exists today in our country. Because it's a critique of the West. So Patochka is saying, I'm here in Czechoslovakia and I'm rejecting the East and the West. So I'm not the great philosopher of the West democracy, because I insist on this experience of the mystery, transcendence. Um, so that's the political argument, or the political provocation, is that it's a critique of any system of totality. Uh, so you could see it as a critique of politics itself, if politics is fundamentally about totalization, which is Rosenstein's argument. So Rosenstein, who before the war writes a PhD on Hegel and the state. Argues that Hegel is the philosopher of totality. And the system and, and the legacy of German idealism is to think philosophy as the system of totality. Um, so Hegel brings philosophy to the end because he brings to the end the idea that philosophy is about totality. And, and the history of the West is about totality. And what does that mean? It's predicated on the principle of identity. That A is A. So if you read that letter and you're like, what's the schema going on? It's a kind of deep reflection on the fundamental problem of the relationship between the principle of identity, A is A, the Parmidian principle, being is thinking. And the notion of totality. And what's brilliant about Rosenzweig is that he formulates this first in a political context of the critique of Hegel, and then he forms a formulates it in a pure theoretical context in the Star of Redemption. Um, so this is metaphysics, if you wish. Uh, and then the whole problem of revelation is revelation would be that experience that breaks the identity of being and thinking. It's the experience of a radical transcend, a rupture. Um, and this is the debate in the letter about what is the structure of revelation? Does it have any intrinsic validation? And what is the relationship between, between history and revelation? Now here, what's important, I'll, I'll just launch into this. So your brain's been canceled. It's really an exception. <laughs> Um, is Herbert Cohen during the war, because you know, Herbert Cohen is the great founder of German neo-communism in Warburg, who then, when he retires, becomes the most important philosopher for the renewal of Jewish thinking in Germany, because he was made the director of the newly established Hochschule für Jüdische Wissenschaft in Berlin, which was one of the great achievements of the German Wilhelmine Empire, which is one of the great tragedies that in the 1890s and before the war, there's a great liberalization of the relationship to Jewish culture in Germany. Abhi Rabu, 
um, you know, all these great German intellectuals founding their own institutes. And so they, they were started an academy for the study of, of Jewish thinking, Jewish culture. And Kohen was in charge of that. Kohen, the last book that Kohen writes is on Judaism, where he tries to show, and this is also what he argues in Deutsch to Menudentum, he tries to show that the philosophical meaning of Judaism is consistent with Kantian thinking. But he wants to say that Kantianism, which he takes to be the great achievement of German ideas, and Judaism have the same ethics. Kind of an amazing interpretation. Um, and why he says that is he says, look, the key about Kantianism is that when Kant says that we cannot think and understand the question of freedom, because freedom is not an object of understanding, it is an idea of reason, then it means that freedom as the good is higher than being. Because being is the law of identity which governs the synthesis of the manifold of the understanding. But since freedom is not an object of thinking, but an idea of reason, then freedom is higher than being. And indeed, freedom is more basic than being. Because reason not only is theoretical, but practical. So I cannot know if I'm free, but I can act in freedom. So what Kohen says is this is a fundamental rupture with thinking because it elevates the good above being through the idea of freedom. And that this idea of freedom, that is in ethics, that what it is to be human is to, in a sense, be autonomous through a system of laws, which is a process of becoming. And he argues that actually, if you go back to the Old Testament and Judaic text, this is, this, this is how he understands Judaic religion. So he reads Kantian ethics into Judaism and reads Judaism into Kant. It's quite clever. Because it's saying, look, you think Kant is the great German philosopher? No. He's going to be the great philosopher who brings to completion the philosophical legacy of Judaism. So it's a very brave argument to make. Um, in a context where people now start attacking Kohen for being Jewish and saying, as this guy called Bruno Bauch, Bruno Bauch in 1917 wrote an article in Kant Studie. In fact, Bruno Bach was the editor of Kant's Studio. It's pretty crazy to think that people could do this. Where he said, look, um, Herman Cohen can't interpret Kant because he's Jewish. No Jew can read Kant because Kant is a German. And this is, this is you know, the, the atmosphere during the First World War because there's an increasing nervousness in Germany about who, who is our real friends. You know, this problem of solidarity. The war is being lost and there's a sense that Somebody is betraying us, this sort of paranoia of, of who is the enemy. And what Cohen argues is precisely the opposite. Um, so the system of German idealism and Judaism are going to be merged. And it also means that what Cohen is doing culturally is he's trying to assimilate Germans and Jews into one culture. Because what he's saying is, look, Kant, the great philosopher of Germany, and Judaism are philosophically equivalent. So the Jews can be fully assimilated into German culture. And this is what Rosenzweig is going to react against. Because Rosenzweig is going to say, look, it's a really important idea to recognize that the good is higher than being. It puts into question the law of identity. Because we cannot know what freedom is, but we can be free. But what's not good about Kohen is that it's too much about the assimilation of Judaism into Western culture. So Kohen is the attempt to bring together Athens and Jerusalem. So philosophy, Greek philosophy, as it culminates in Kant and monotheism in its original Judaic form. And what Rosenzweig wants to do is he wants to, and at the time they called it actually Ionia and Vienna. Of course, Vienna was the height of German idealism. 
Fichte, etc., and Ionia. So the attempt to bring Ionia and Yina together. And Rosenzweig wants to actually break this by saying, I want to fully, in a sense, reject the law of identity, which undermine, which undergirds totality, the notion of totality. And instead, I'm looking for the experience of a kind of radical revelation, which is the experience of alterity. And that experience of alterity is going to be given to him the clue in the experience of death, of being towards death. Um, so that's why there's a very direct connection between the First World War and his service. Because the experience of death is precisely the experience of a relationship to a transcendence which breaks the because we cannot think the identity of death, because death is my known being. And so based on this insight on death and trans as the experience of transcendence that breaks and ruptures the principle of identity, um, and breaks totality, it's the experience of alterity, then that is, sets up the idea of the structure of revelation and the question of how does one pass from nothingness into being. Um, and so then the star of redemption is going to be about the three moments of the passage of nothingness into being, which is creation, revelation, and redemption. Um, which is God, world, and man, so God as the principle of creation, revelation as the revelation in the world, and redemption of redemption of man in the world. Each of these three are movements of the passage of nothing into being, and each of these three are movements of temporality. Um, and so this is the way, if you read the letter, this idea that revelation as an experience of radical transcendence breaks the principle of identity. It is the experience of alterity, which is the passage of nothingness into being, and that breaks totality. Um, of course, if you know Levinas, you see that this is very Levinas. Levinas is something that is inside you, because totalité in that me is precisely this argument. I mean, it has, um, that precisely thinking and the thinking of metaphysics, which is the thinking of war, because it's the society that has perpetually closed on itself and reduced the principle of identity, is a thinking of totality, of identity, and the genuine ethical is the experience of the epiphany of the face, the revelation which breaks it. Um, and that's going to be then the Rosen Saidi and the one, one idea that then opens up the argument of the star of redemption um, as the attempt to rethink the meaning of creation, revelation, and redemption in a form of thinking which has abandoned totality and the principle of identity, um, at which the principle of the common nothingness is absolutely central, uh, as well as Shem, that's another story. Uh, was the time was a great expert on Shem. Um, I've just read Shem's Ages of the World, which had just been published and discovered. So, I just ended by saying what's interesting about Rosenzweig and Cohen is you see another part of the problem or the effect of World War I is the relationship between Judaism and, and Germany as a philosophical problem. Um, and the way in which Cohen tries to reconcile philosophically and culturally German Jews with Germany. And he does this at a sophisticated philosophical level, but it's also a cultural to say, look, we can be one. We can have. And the key term that Cohen uses in Deutsche Mühlentum, if you read it in German, is Verständigung. We can understand and be with each other. There is no antagonism between Germany and Judaism. It's about Verständigung. And this has something to do with this sort of, what he calls prophetic messianism, which he finds in Judaism and in Kant. Um, it's a kind of ethics of humanity as a true religion, so it's very secularized. And, and this is what Rosenzweig is going to react against. Um, and the reaction against it forces him to reject the basic premise of Western thought, which is the principle of identity and the idea of totality. Uh, and here, of course, it's quite interesting because you see the similar kind of gesture in Heidegger, of course, who is going to reject the principle of identity, the principle of totality. Um, 
And Rosenzweig makes this explicit as a critique of politics in his dissertation that he writes before the war and publishes after about Hegel and the state. And it's really Rosenzweig who elevates Hegel to be the bad boy of totalitarianism. Because when you think of Hegel, you think of totality. That's really Rosenzweig who puts it that way. He says, look, the problem with Hegel is that it's a philosopher of totality. And that brings Western culture to an end. Um, and that is the structure of violence of Western thinking, which excludes otherness. That otherness is for us being Jewish. And, our, and so I'm going to reaffirm the irreducibility and alterity of Judaism as the very star of the redemption of mankind. Uh, and that's why it's a very powerful argument, philosophically as well as culturally. Um, and what's interesting, just one last thing, and then we can see if we can talk about it, is that though it's miles away from Katochka, you see that the problem of nothingness in Revelation is actually central. And the attempt to think philosophically the category of transcendence through the experience of the First World War, or as a consequence of the experience of the First World War. Precisely because, as Patochka argued, what the First World War shows us is that our culture, and this goes to your, you know, maybe today, is completely obsessed with totalization. Everything has to be visible, everything has to be known, everything has to be under control. There is no openness to something that is not under our control. And any openness is, is met with anxiety. Um, so that's the idea that our culture is a culture of pure imminence. And there's really no sense of alterity. Everything is going to be, you know, my favorite metaphor for this, if you know Star Trek, the next generation is the Borg. <laughs> no one knows Star Trek, next generation. No one knows Star Trek? Okay. <laughs> the Borg, right? The most brilliant character in Star Trek is this alien civilization that is a hive mind called the Borg that assimilates otherness into itself and is therefore unstoppable. Um, and so the tremendous power of the Borg is the process of assimilation, of absorption. Um, so even Captain Picard and the Enterprise, etc. Everything becomes assimilated into the Borg, and in the Borg, no one thinks because it's, it's the totality that thinks. Um, and it's, it's just a cube in space. And, then, uh, and that is a powerful metaphor, I think, because I think the Borg is a critique of ourselves. Um, and, you know, it's a, a metaphor, but that's exactly what people like Patochka, especially Patochka, that's what his diagnosis of our civilization. We live in the Borg. Everything is about assimilation and identity and absorption and totalization and totality. And what he thinks, again, is we need this experience of rupture, of violence, which is a rupture to a relationship to something other than ourselves in order to anchor the very meaning of what it is to be human. So that's also why Patochka is an anti-humanist in this sense. Um, because we need this relationship to the other. Now, whether that other is God or the Levinasim other is, is not clear. But it is an argument about alternative. And that's something that you see also in Rosenzweig, though it's understood very well. This need for alternative. Um, and the war is the opportunity to regenerate why alternative is important as, as, as a kind of structure of transcendence. Because precisely for Adoption, the war is completely the foreclosure of any alternative because all alterity is antagonistic. The, all alterity is something that we want to destroy or absorb, but that's the Borg. The Borg is the war machine. Or, since I'm now losing the deep sense of seriousness, or, it's, or Black Sabbath, the war pig. If you read the great Black Sabbath song, the war pig is that. Uh, it's the machine of war that absorbs and absorbs and absorbs alterity. Um, and that doesn't produce meaning, it produces emptiness. And that's what Patrick says, the First World War hasn't changed anything because we are, we are still looking for that experience of transcendence, um, which he thinks these guys experience. Okay, but I apologize for the brief thing it wasn't so I just wanted to get it in there. Also for, I you know, to read something new for the holidays. Um, it's a really, a, yeah, I think one of the great books of philosophy. Um, and deeply connected to the first world war in this sense. Okay, are there any questions just on the five sentences? Uh
not even the appetizer, but the onion push that I gave you, it was inside, um, or a touch trap. I know you're all tired of going to hungry. Um, any questions on Patochka or Bozen's friend or the connection or the problem not to this? Okay, you're all depressed. <laughs> 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 okay. okay, I know it's, if you have no questions for that, then let me just remind you, January 15th, Toledo. If you have any questions about your...